you got your Bibles, turn with me. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. You can also go on cc.guide, follow along on the talk notes. Uh, we started on March 6th this journey of Lent. And some of you, this may be new to you. Some of you don't, haven't been here the last few weeks. You're playing a little bit of catch up. And so Lent is the 40 days leading up to Easter where we kind of prepare our hearts, where we just really lean in. It's a time of, of corporate repentance and, and examining our lives. It's a time of prayer and fasting. And so many of you in the room, you're fasting something right now. And whether it's food or caffeine or time on your phone or TV or, or something that you've grown attached to just throughout life, maybe overly attached to. And so you fast something and there's kind of a ripping away of that, but it's really reordering our attention and our lives around the cross of Jesus, around the life of Jesus. And what we're doing on this journey of Lent is really just following the life of Jesus up to the cross and the resurrection. And what did Jesus do? What did he say? And how can we as disciples of Jesus just follow him on his journey? It's, it's as simple as that. And it's one of those things that sometimes uh, we, we don't always follow the Christian calendar. And so we'll get to these major events of, of the Christian faith, like the Incarnation and Christmas or uh, Good Friday or Easter or uh, Pentecost. We get to these days and they can just kind of sneak up on us. Like I just know people are like, oh, Easter is next week. You know what? I should make brunch plans with my family. You know, I didn't know it was next week. Instead of processing like this, this process of what is God doing in our life and how can we prepare our hearts, it, it just kind of shows up. And we're like, oh man, you know what, I, I didn't really even have time to process it. I think of it like this, if you've ever been on vacation with your family or uh, with friends, you stop at like an aquarium or zoo or museum, or maybe it's like this uh, natural history site, and you've got like two hours to see everything. Anybody been there? You're like, you need two days, but you have two hours. We're going to see everything we possibly can in two hours. You're not really taking it in, are you? You're just trying to get through it. You're just like, you know what? We paid for this. We're going to get through it all. We're going to see it all. You're going to like it, you know? Um, that's how I feel about Disney World. It's like, you better like this, kids. We just paid a lot of money for this. You know, and so if you've ever done that, that's kind of what we do with Easter and Good Friday. What, what these rhythms allow us to do is to take it in, is to stop and say, man, we're, we're preparing our hearts because one of the most significant events the world has ever seen uh, is coming up. When Jesus went to the cross, and we'll gather together around Good Friday, and then we celebrate on Sunday the resurrection. And, and we want you to go on that journey with us. You can jump on cc.guide and, and, and sign up even now, just for the next few weeks that we have left to kind of go on this prayer and fasting journey. Uh, I send encouragement emails out throughout the week just to let you know that we're doing this together. And it's a time that if you commit yourself to it, you'll find is deeply rich. And even when the time of, of Easter comes upon us, when we gather together, you'll realize there, there'll be a different life about it because we've spent these 40 days in repentance and fasting and prayer. And there's something different about that whenever you spend that time. And so I want to invite you uh, to do that with us. If you got your Bibles, Luke chapter 9, verse 51 uh, is where we're picking up. Here's what we're doing. We're following Jesus to the cross. The next few weeks, we're simply looking at these moments in the life of Jesus throughout the Gospels leading him up to the cross and the resurrection. Luke chapter 9, verse 51 says this. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. I want to stop for a moment. Each of the Gospels tells the story a little bit different. Think of it like this. It's the same story, but there's four different camera angles on the story. Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience. Mark is the shortest chapter, and, and right when Jesus shows up in the Gospel of Mark, he's already looking towards Jerusalem. Luke is written to a Gentile audience. John is just completely different than the Synoptic Gospels altogether. And each of them have a moment in the Gospels where Jesus looks toward Jerusalem and realizes that that's his final destiny. He realizes that not only am I going to go to Jerusalem, but I'm not going to leave Jerusalem. And I'm going to be arrested, and I'm going to give my life. In the Gospel of Luke, we get it in chapter 9, where it, it's almost like Jesus is ministering, he's healing the sick, he's doing all these things, and he looks toward Jerusalem realizing, that's where I'm headed. I want you to see this about the life of Jesus. This morning's message is incredibly simple, and it's probably the most challenging message you'll ever hear, or I'll ever hear. It's incredibly simple. Jesus looked toward Jerusalem because he lived his life with purpose. He did not aimlessly wander about trying to figure out who he was, where he was going, or what he was called to. 
Can I tell you the number one question I get, especially among college students and young 20-somethings and 30-somethings, is what am I supposed to do with my life? And I'm not trying to oversimplify something complicated, but let me just tell you very, very succinctly, your number one calling in life is to know God and to live on mission as a disciple. Period. As you do that, as you are living that life of obedience and discipleship to Jesus, Jesus, and it will, the Holy Spirit will direct your path and lead you to the things that you need to. I, I know what most people are asking, what's my vocation? What's my sweet spot? What's, what's that thing I'm supposed to be doing? But, but first and foremost, it's becoming a disciple. And so what, what happens is when you realize that that's your primary calling, it takes the pressure off you to try to make it happen or figure it out. And what you do is you let go and say, God, as you lead me, wherever you lead me, I'll go. Amen. And as you walk, what happens is the Holy Spirit leads you into those places. So instead of us trying to figure it out on the front end, we just begin to walk it out and live our life for Jesus, and we allow him to figure it out. How many of that sounds better? Does that sound better? It, it, it's not up to me. And you see Jesus living his life with purpose. He wasn't here just to try to get everything that he needed or live the American dream as we have or find this place of comfort or security. He had purpose, knowing that he was here for a short season and a time to fulfill the will of his father. Let's continue reading. Verse 52 says, And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked him, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Seems a little extreme to me. I don't know about you. <laughs> Verse 55, but Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you and go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my father. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for, the, for service in the kingdom of God. Let me tell you something about the passages we just read. If you were completely honest with me this morning, and I'm not going to have you raise your hand, of how many people, when you read these passages, they make you uncomfortable, the majority of us would have our hands in the air. We would. And, and I feel like for two reasons. Number one is because we don't really understand what discipleship to Jesus means anymore. We've dumbed it, dumbed it down to a level that uh, it requires no sacrifice. And number two, we misunderstand what Jesus is really trying to say. And so we're going to lean in this morning to some very difficult passages from some scriptures that when you're reading these in your devotional times, you read them a little bit more quickly and you just move right on. You do. Because you're like, I don't know what that means. And that seems a little bit extreme. And so maybe that was just for those following Jesus at that time, but that can't be applicable to me today. And I'm with you on that. They're difficult passages. It says Jesus sent messengers ahead to the Samaritan village, and we don't get, have time to go in the background, but there were so many disagreements between Samaritans and Jews, and, and, and even about the law and where the, the, the temple and the tabernacle and the, the center of the world should be. And so not only did they reject him because he was a Jew and headed toward Jerusalem, but they rejected Jesus because of who he was and the message that he preached. And something you have to realize about Jesus, the moment he set his eyes towards Jerusalem and began to walk the path towards the cross... The main theme of his life becomes rejection. Everybody rejects him. In fact, it starts slowly and it builds up all the way to the cross where even the disciples are walking away in fear. And it's really John and his mother that are there at the foot of the cross. It's amazing that as the path gets harder, as we're called to follow Jesus closer and closer, and, and when, the, when the opposition becomes real, how many knows everybody scatters? And that's, that's just what you see in Scripture. And we're actually going to see how that, that affects our lives and parallels our lives as we walk out this Lent journey the next few weeks. But opposition and rejection is real. Some of us in the room have no context for that in our faith. We, most of us, have grown up in a culture where Christianity was mainstream. It was the popular thing to do. That tide is shifting. 
in an increasingly post-Christian society, now there's things that if, you've, if you, you live your life in the kingdom of God, if you follow the truth of scripture, what you're following will no longer be popular. You better come to grips of what it means to be in a room where you're no longer the most popular. Where people are going to look at what you believe and what you do and think to yourself, that's outdated, it's antiquated, it's traditional, no one does it that way, why would you do that? And if, you're, and if you're, your job in life or your goal in life is to be the most popular, you're probably not going to be able to live a life in the kingdom. I'm just being honest with you. Because culture is moving far and farther away from this. And so some of us, we, we've never looked at like, what does opposition or rejection or some level of persecution look like here for me? But the more that Jesus walked and the more that he went and the closer he got to Jerusalem, there's more people that looked and said, no. Not only do we not believe in you, but we wholeheartedly reject your way of thinking, your ideology, and what you say you're going to do. As we walk with Jesus, we have to ask ourselves, what does that look like in our life? If you're taking notes this morning, we have so watered down our understanding of discipleship in the church today that we equate church attendance and not radical sacrifice as discipleship to Jesus. As a pastor, l- let me tell you this. I'm not, I'm not picking on city church. I- I'm going to pick on the church for a minute. I love the church. I love it. It's the hope of the world. The church in America today, we have a discipleship problem. We fill our seats full of people who think discipleship to Jesus is down here and so easy that everybody can step over and everybody, and we want everybody to enter into the kingdom. Let me tell you what Jesus was continually doing. The longer you walk with Jesus, he continued to raise the bar. And he raised the bar to places that were uncomfortable, that make us squirm, that make us evaluate our lives and our futures and our stuff and our hearts and our motives. Every one of us. Nobody is excluded from this. He doesn't drop it down to the level to say, you know what? Everybody can become a disciple. And if you just give me any part of you, you're a disciple. No, eventually Jesus always calls from that thing in your life that you're least willing to give. He always calls you to go now and not later. And there's always a reason you can't go now. And there's always a reason that you can't give this thing up. And there's always something that tugs at our heart that says, you know what? That's going to require just a little bit more than I'm comfortable with. And let me just tell you, we've grown up in in this church society that, that I take ownership of this too as leadership of this church. There are times where we've just said, you know what? You can sit there and never become a disciple. And just as long as you love God and sing the songs, you're good. Jesus never did that. Ever. He always looked at people, loved them, and called them to this level of living that would require radical sacrifice. Even to the point where there are always people in Jesus' life that walked away because they were like, man, that that price tag is higher than I want to pay. And Jesus raising the standard and the bar of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I want you to imagine with me this guy runs up to Jesus and says, Jesus, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus looks back at him and didn't just say, yeah, fall in line. You know what? Join the crowd. There's thousands now. He says this. He says, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of God has no place to lay his head. If you're taking notes, discipleship to Jesus will inevitably require rejection or criticism at some level. Jesus is not telling you to be a disciple, you need to be homeless. It's not what he's saying. He's saying that everywhere I've been, even my hometown, I've faced rejection. In fact, I have no place that I can even call home anymore. Are you willing to go with me to a place where you may no longer have a hometown? Are you willing to walk with me through difficulty? Because it's not just roses walking with Jesus. There's pain, and there's difficulty, and there's opposition. See, sometimes we read about the opposition Jesus faced, or the opposition in the book of Acts that the new church faced, or the opposition that Paul faced as he planted all these churches, and we think to ourselves, man, that's awesome how God helped them overcome. But when we face the opposition, we ask ourselves, God, where are you? And how could you allow me to go through this? See, this is the other side of the gospel message, and I grew up in a background where all we talked about were the blessings, and all we talked about was eternal life, and we raised our hand every Sunday and repented of our sins because we wanted to get out of hell. Amen? And there's another side of things of discipleship that says, you know what, you also have to count the cost. You have to look and say, man, what is this going to require of me? And this is, this, is, this is a difficult message, but on this journey of Lent, we can't preach the cross without walking with Jesus. 
and looking and saying, what does our cross look like? What does it look like to be crucified with Christ? What does it look like for us to walk with Jesus as he carries our cross, his cross, and he looks back at us and says, unless you pick up your cross. And all of us have that. And there's something that Jesus is going to ask of that we're going to be hesitant to let go of. Some of you right now, you already know what it is. Some of you, what I'm going to pray by the end of this message is that the Holy Spirit will speak to you. Because one of the things that Lent does is it confronts us with our idolatry. Lent is a time of repentance. It's a time of corporate repentance where we go to God and say, God, there are things in our life that we have held on more dearly than you. God, forgive me for loving something more than you. Forgive me for choosing this over you. Forgive me for trying to find life in something I knew was not going to bring me life, and yet I keep going back to that thing or that relationship or that person or that substance or that event. God, forgive me of that. Discipleship to Jesus will inevitably require rejection or criticism at some level. Why does Jesus tell a would-be disciple that he has no place to lay his head? The answer is simple, because he expects his disciples to be like him. And he wants them to know it's costly. That the Calvary road is not the road of material prosperity. There's moments of trial and difficulty. You have to reject your desire just for more comfort and more luxury. You have to reject this American dream that so many of us want to pursue for more power or more control or more comfort because the American dream and the kingdom life are often in opposition to each other. Often. The second person Jesus said to another man, he said, follow me. And if this doesn't make you uncomfortable, I don't know what will. The guy says, first, let me go and bury my father. Seems reasonable, right? Let me go take care of my deceased father who just passed away, which Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. I'm all about being real and asking real questions. When I read this, I'm like, Jesus, seriously? Really? The guy can't go and like have a funeral? As I studied this more, there's actually a play on words that we miss in the original language. There are times where the original Greek and the Aramaic that Jesus spoke actually gives us more insight on the text, and this is one of those moments. What Jesus actually says is this, let the spiritually dead bury their own physically dead. Let the spiritually dead bury their own physically dead. And that may seem a little harsh. One of the greatest Jewish customs, if you grew up in, this Jewish, in, the, in the Jewish world, you were required to take care of the elderly, and then when someone passed away, to give them a proper burial. So if, if Jesus is saying this in a Jewish context, let me just tell you, there are people who are, like, their, their jaw is on the floor. You're telling me not to go bury my father, but come follow you now? What are you asking me? That, that's extreme. If you're taking notes this morning, Jesus requires a radical shift in priorities. Jesus is not telling you not to take care of your mom and dad, not to honor them, not to love people. What he is saying is this, there's always a reason why you can't go now. There's always a reason why discipleship to Jesus should happen later. There's always going to be something standing in your way. You know what? I need to go get this figured out in life first. You know what? I, need to, I, need, I just need to be in a financial place where I can do this. I, there's some things that I need to take care of. And Jesus says, the call to discipleship is always now. It's always now. It's always now. It's never tomorrow. Because you'll never do it tomorrow. Because you know what? You're going to go bury your father or your mother. And then guess what? Something else is going to happen. And then you're going to go over here. And you're going to go over here. And you're going to have really great intentions about being a disciple. But it's never actually happened. It's hard, isn't it? It's a hard message. The last one says this. He says, I'll follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. Seems reasonable. Jesus says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. If you're taking notes, entering kingdom life means you no longer look back fondly on what you've left behind. Again, Jesus is not saying don't love your family or neglect them. What he is saying is this. You can't walk the path of discipleship looking behind you, thinking about all the things that you miss. Man, I miss the days when I just did that. I miss the days when I was doing those things. You can't walk forward in Christ when you're holding on to the past, when you're holding on to those things. You have to reprioritize what is truly important now. 
These are the questions where Jesus takes discipleship from here and he raises the bar and level to here that looks that now we look and say, man, that bar is high. And Jesus says, I know because it requires everything. This bar requires some things. This requires everything. But only in this level do you find life. You're not going to find life here because there's going to be parts of your soul and parts of your heart that, that you don't give me, that you hold on to. And the things that you hold on to are, are what Lord of your life. Those are the Lords of your life. The things that you cling to, the things that you revert back to, the things that you can't live without, that's what's Lord. When you get to this level, you're saying, man, there's nothing left that I have that's not yours. God, you can have it all. Why would Jesus call us to such this level of living? Because Jesus knows this. He, he knows that we want to experience resurrection, but we don't want to experience crucifixion. We all want to reign with Christ, but nobody wants to die with Christ. We all want the new life, but nobody wants to leave their life behind. We all want to receive the kingdom, but nobody wants to let go of the way that we're living. In Luke chapter 17, verse 33, Jesus would say this, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. If you let your life go, you will save it. All throughout the Bible, there are these paradoxes of the kingdom of God. Paradoxes are two seemingly contradictory statements that actually present a truth. They seem to be contradictory, but actually, they, and held together in a tension, they actually present some kind of truth, and they're all throughout the Bible. Jesus and Paul uses them constantly. And he says, okay, you want to you hold on tight? You'll never experience new life. Only by letting go do you receive life. This, this applies to everything. You want to hold on to your kids? You want to hold tightly onto your kids and make sure they never fall and make sure their, their future is planned and all these things? Guess what? You're going to lose your kids. I'm just telling you. You can't hold on to them and grip onto them and, and, and find life. You're going to lose them. You want to hold on to your finances and you say, you know what? My finances, I'm going to control everything. I'm going to make sure that I'm, uh, I'm never without lacking and I never have to live by faith and all these things. Guess what? Now your finances control you, not you controlling your finances. It's this paradox of the kingdom. And all of us right now, there's something inside of us that we gravitate towards, we hold on to, and we ask God, call us to anything, ask for anything, but please don't ask for that. There's always something. I think of the rich young ruler that runs up so passionate for Jesus, man, I'm ready to follow you. And he says, oh, really? There's something else on the throne of your heart right now. You got a lot of stuff. And go sell it to the poor. Come and follow me. The man's face drops. What did Jesus just do? He just raised the bar of discipleship from here to here. Not because he didn't want the man to enter, but because he wanted the man to experience life in its fullest. He's not doing it to keep you out. He's doing it because Jesus knows something about our hearts. They are idol factories. We're continually finding new ways of putting things above him. And if he doesn't have full control, if he's not Lord of everything, he's Lord of nothing. If you and I are going to experience life, what does it look like for us to let go of everything? Let me tell you, that this is a tension as a follower of Jesus that you will never perfect. This side of heaven. Are you with me? Yes. You'll never perfect it. We are being formed and made in the image. And I, I believe you can grow in freedom in Christ. But this is a tension as long as we live on this earth. Until Christ returns, that we are constantly going to be warring between the spirit and the flesh, between the things and the idols that we place and, and, and having God as, as Lord. That's why there are seasons of the Christian calendar. There's a seasons like we end where we go through times of repentance. Why? Because we have to repent. Why? Because we're continually crafting new idols and we're continually placing other things on our heart. And so this is a time to kind of clear the slate and say, God, there's nothing else that I want right now more than you. When Jesus set his face to walk the Calvary road, he was not merely taking our place. He was setting our pattern. Jesus is both substitute and pace setter. He's the substitute and the pace setter. I, I want you to understand this, that Jesus is not just substitute, but he shows us how to live. And I think if Jesus was here walking with us today, he would tell people, hey, when you walk with me, there's going to be opposition because he told everybody who walked with him that, but guess what? I'm with you every step of the journey. 
So much of the opposition or the struggle that you and I fear so much, guess what? God gives you the grace and the moment to get through it. You may have some bumps and bruises, but guess what those bumps and bruises become? They just become testimonies of God's grace. They just become an incredible story of, look what God delivered me through. Look how God provided. Look what I was so fearful of, of letting go. But when I did, here's what God did. That's what God wants to do. That's how God wants to write your story. But so many of us on this side of discipleship live in fear of like, what's it going to cost? Don't fixate on the cost because God will see you through it. Fixate it on the joy of living a life in Christ, of life in the kingdom. Some of you have heard these stories of me. I I grew up so passionate uh, about football. I grew up in the promised land, Norman, Oklahoma, like right next to the stadium. Some of you are like, oh, you're no you fan. No, like I, I was indoctrinated <laughs> as a baby. Like we all went to the game together. I went to every game. There was, a, there was a time in my life, don't judge me for this, I did not miss an OU home game for eight years straight. Some of you are judging me, don't. I love it. It's just a part of my childhood. I mean, as a kid, I would walk the stands selling stuff for missions, and I was just always in the stadium, and my whole family went. And even now, it's just like a rite of passage where I take all my kids, and I'm like, hey, this is where I used to do this. I mean, it's just, it was my life, and I grew up loving football. So as I grew up, I was like, you know what? I'm going to play football. There's just one problem with that. Like, I was the skinniest kid you've ever seen in your entire life. I, I'm, I'm not saying like I was a little bit skinny. Like, you looked at me, and people were trying to sponsor me for $30 a month because they were like... <laughs> feed this child. (laughs) As I got older, I would try to eat a ton. It did not matter. I was like so skinny. Not only that, I wasn't tall yet. I was a late bloomer. And so I didn't get tall to later in life. So I was like short and skinny. That's not a good combination for football. And so every year I was like, I'm going to play football, but I just was never big enough. And so I was always pretty good at basketball and and baseball. And so my seventh grade year, uh, probably the smallest seventh grader you've ever seen in your life. I'm like, I'm going to play football. And I, and I attended this small Christian school in, in North Dallas. And so it was one of those schools like everybody played football because we don't have enough people to play. Not only are you going to play, but you're actually going to play. And so I remember my first game, we were on the road in the bus traveling to the state champions who like they would have like 5,000 people at their games in junior high. I had never played football in my life. I was the kick returner. We won the toss and chose to receive. It's the only time in my life I really thought I was going to pee in my pants. <laughs> I'm serious. I can remember my knees shaking as I'm back on the goal line, like 11 people are about to come and take my head off. And I'm like 115 pounds dripping wet. I mean, I was skinny. And I remember the first game just getting leveled and coming back home that night. And my mom's like, you're never playing again. Bumps and bruises everywhere. I mean, I was one giant bruise. Uh, I remember the second game of the year. He was at home. And uh, we were playing this, uh, this really good team again. And the wide receiver that I was guarding, I was playing cornerback. He was like 6'2", maybe 175, 180. The largest man I'd ever seen. I was like, give me your birth certificate. You're in seventh grade. Yeah, right? <laughs> and I remember, <laughs> I've told this story before, the coach on the other team, literally instead of calling an audible, he just looks at the quarterback and he just says, hey, throw it to the receiver. Because he saw me and how little I was. We're just going to throw it to him every play. And the first play of the game, they snap the ball. He throws it directly to the receiver. I dive in, head down, latch on, and he drags me for eight yards. (laughs) But I got half a tackle on that one, so until the rest of the team got there. That was pretty much the highlight of my career. And I never played football again. I did have one touchdown. It was an act of God. I don't have time to tell that story. But let me tell you what I remember about playing football. I played. I played. I was in the game. And sometimes what we do is we live our life in faith on the sidelines and we watch other people play because we're so fearful that we're going to get hit. What if I get injured? You play the game, you're going to get injured. It's just a part of life. And you can sit and be fearful about it happening or you go play the game and you realize even when you get injured, guess what? You get back up. You move on. You rub some dirt on it. You move forward. And I I want to encourage you, some of you this morning, in a very simple message. We have a discipleship problem. We have a discipleship problem in the church. This may go against 
some of the way that you guys grew up or maybe some of your theology and maybe we can have a one-on-one conversation later, but we live in a culture that what we try to do is to get people raise their hand and pray a prayer. Go to scripture and show me where Jesus did that. I'm not saying it doesn't have a place, but our goal so many times is to get people to recite a prayer. The goal of Jesus was always trying to get them a discipleship to him. He was continually leading people deeper. Not just of confession, but of repentance and a life in Christ. And I believe in the church today, what we've got to do is realize Jesus did not set the bar down here. He set it up here. So without crucifixion and death, there's no resurrection. And if we're going to walk with Jesus on the journey to the cross, then we have to ask ourselves the hard questions. We have to look inside of ourselves and be willing to ask ourselves, what does it look like to follow Jesus? Here's what encourages me, though. And and here's what keeps me in this and keeps me pastoring and keeps me getting up here every week because I see people in our church who are rejecting the American dream and rejecting even just this kind of philosophy in the church that I can sit in a seat and never be a disciple. That's not a thing. It's not optional, it never has been. I see people rejecting that. There's a group of people in our church right now that are looking at their natural social networks and saying, how can I make disciples to the places that God's calling me? How can I love people and redeem what's broken? They're rethinking and rejecting the the American dream and rethinking of how do I use my house for the kingdom of God? How do you use my occupation? How can I parent my kids differently? They're, they're, They're walking out of the broad road and walking down the narrow road and rethinking kingdom life. To me, that's beautiful. How do you know you're beginning to experience life in the kingdom when you start to let go of your life? You don't care what it costs anymore. Let me tell you, I can tell you parts of your story that are inevitable. The first part of your story is going to be this. It's going to be the price. There's a cost. If you were here last week, Pastor Gibson from Kenya he asked the question, do you have a faith or a, a Christian faith that costs you nothing? There's going to be a price, but guess what? God is with you every moment. You never regret it. No one ever goes back after moving forward in faith saying, you know what? I wish I wouldn't have done that. I've never heard that story. And in the midst of your opposition or whatever you're going through, God is going to walk with you. He's going to sustain you. Your faith will be built. You'll learn more about God and who he is. You'll understand his goodness in a deeper way. You know why? Because you're going to need it like never before. I'm telling you, church, hear me. When you walk by faith, it transforms your relationship with Jesus because now Jesus is not just on the periphery and something that you you need when when you need him. Now he is your sustainer. He's your everything. God, if I don't have you today, I don't, I don't know how this is going to turn out. And guess what it does to you? It positions you in the place where God wants you to live all along, fully abandoned to him. The first part is the price. The second part of your story is the joy of living by faith. I can't make the second part happen for you. I wish I could. If I could just get everybody in that position, but you have to take a step of faith. You have to move out. You have to say, you know what? I'm willing to pick up the cross. I'm willing to pay the price. I'm willing to invite discomfort because I want to live with Christ. I want to reign with him. You've heard me say this a million times if you've been at City Church. Everybody has problems. Everybody. They're inevitable, they're a part of life. Will your problems be about you and your selfishness or will your problems be about the kingdom of God and living on mission? I want the problems in my life to be because we've positioned our family to live on mission for Jesus. That's where I want my problems to be about. Here's what I'm gonna ask from you. I just want you to close your eyes where you're at. The best teacher is always the Holy Spirit. When I was a young pastor, I used to try to do the perfect altar call. Now, as I get a little bit older, I realize I just close it down and allow the Holy Spirit to speak. And the Holy Spirit this morning, what he wants to do is challenge you because he loves you. What the Holy Spirit wants to do is convict you of sin because he wants to draw you near to Jesus in his heart. 
What the Holy Spirit wants to do is wants to rip out idols in your life so that you could walk in freedom. The Holy Spirit doesn't always lead you into more comfortable places, but he always leads you into deeper places of freedom. Sometimes freedom is uncomfortable. And we're going to give God just a minute. And I'm corporately, as your pastor, going to lead the way in repentance this morning. There's areas of my life where I've exchanged what is ultimate for what is good. I put the good things in my life and I've, I, I've made idols out of things and even ministry. I've tried to protect my family or my kids instead of releasing them and giving them to God. I've tried to determine my own future instead of living with palms open and up and saying, God, it's yours. Whatever you want to do, you write the dream, you write the story. I'm just going to walk with you. Maybe there's a kingdom dream that God's birthed in you and you're so fearful about the price. Let me tell you, don't fear it. God's with you. Is there an area of your life that needs obedience or repentance? Is there a step of faith that he's calling to you? Maybe it's small. Maybe it's, if you said it out loud, you'd almost be embarrassed because it seems so small and insignificant. But if it's where God's calling you right now, the answer has to be yes. God, I'll be obedient in this small little thing that I know you're calling me into that's uncomfortable and outside my comfort zone. Holy Spirit, we invite you. You're already here. You are our counselor. You are our teacher. You are our helper. You are our friend. You stick with us in every moment. And right now, we ask you to rip from our hearts the things, the people, the dreams, the futures, the anxieties, the fears that we have placed above you. God, the things that we have put on the throne of our hearts. God, we want to walk with Jesus in every moment. So we pick up our cross. By picking up our cross means we embrace the difficult, hard things, the sacrifices. And we do so with joy, because if we know that if we die with you, we get to reign and live with you. God, we know that if we crucify our lives, we get to experience resurrection. So we give it to you today, Father. I pray for some people right now who are going on this journey of Lent. They have given up things. They have sacrificed and they're fasting things. God, I pray that you would reveal yourself. God, give us the faith to even when we don't feel you, Even when we have doubts, God, that you're there, that you are shaping us, you are molding us. You're changing our desires. You're changing our hungers from the things of this world to more of you. And God, we lean into the struggle. We lean into the tension because, God, our desire is more of you in our lives. So we ask this morning, Holy Spirit, for you to speak. I want you to just take the next 30 seconds right where you're at, just quietly, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak. Father, we thank you. God, as we repent and let go of things this morning, Lord, we find life in you. God, I pray as we seek you this week, as we continue our prayer and fasting, would we find you this week in the small moments. We thank you for that in Jesus' name.